Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you. So as you may all, all know, um, we've announced this, um, we've sent the flyers around. So starting today, September 11th and the next two Fridays that we have in the month of September, we are going to be hosting God's servant, um, Reverend Emmanuel Osuchirku. And it's going to be ministering to us another broad thing, discipleship. And so you know that this month is a missions and discipleship month. And I'm so glad we already have Pastor Osu um, joining the line. Whilst I take the time to introduce him, I realize that many of our people are not on the line yet. So if you can just send them, um, remind as many as you can, that would be greatly appreciated. Tell them that a man of God is, is already ahead of them. He is waiting and he is um, ready to fire. And so they should join so they can benefit and fully. And so we all know Reverend Imaro Sucheku already. He's the Swabaisen Minister for ICGC Churches in North America and a resident pastor of ICGC Evangel Temple in Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend also has been very instrumental in the planting and establishment of many churches in Ghana and here in North America. And as you know, he's not a stranger to Love Temple at all. He's been here a few times and every quarter, I am privileged to report to him um, the activities of the church. And so he knows exactly what is going on in this place. Reverend Iman also who provides instructional teaching for personal spiritual growth and the development of the total man. His passion is in the area of evangelism, missions, church planting, and discipleship. And our focus for this man is his area. He is personally committed to preparing ambassadors of influence for community transformation. As you may already know, this is a veteran in the faith. He's a married man, married to um, Lady Stella, his dear wife and partner in ministry, and he's a father of three children. Brothers and sisters, without wasting much time, it's my singular honor to invite to take the stage Reverend Emmanuel Owusu-Cheku, our dear son, to minister to us. And so those of you who have joined my video, let's give him a wave offering as he takes the podium to minister to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> so afternoon there. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> well, it's good it's good to uh, meet you again, Love Temple. It's always a joy to be in your midst. And thank you very much, Pastor Emmanuel, for your good leadership and your commitment and dedication to the work God has put into your hands. Church for Information, after Pastor Latte, his reports are always on time <laughs> and always intact. And that's very, very commendable. We thank God for your life and leadership. When last year, we're happy to see him ordained in Dallas, Texas. And uh, we saw the wife to Auntie, Auntie Pat, what did I get right? Auntie Pat? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Auntie Pat, good to see you and your little boy, last baby there. And how, why is uh, Prudence? Prudence available too? Yeah, on okay. the other one, yeah. Okay, we bless God. So uh, I'm glad to be here. So let's get into our uh, discussion tonight. This, this will be the first time, so I'll give an introduction and then we'll build on it. Our, like Pastor said, our theme or our discussion point is on discipleship. I want to talk tonight about the discipleship mindset or true discipleship mindset. True discipleship mindset. That's what I want to build on for tonight. And like we all know, uh, Jesus Christ came into this world and uh, lived for some years, taught, 
died. And then when he was leaving, before he died and before he ascended, his major emphasis was to commission the disciples to go into all the world. Uh, some say, go preach the gospel to all creatures. But the King James says that, go make disciples of all nations. The, the NIV says, go teach all nations. King, the, sorry, sorry, the New King James says, go make disciples of all nations. The King James says that, go teach all nations. So the teaching the nations and making disciples of nations are the same. Amen. Amen. So that was a strong commission that was given to the church. It's called the Great Commission. It's about making disciples of the nations, which automatically begins with evangelism, and we take it from there. So I want us to, first of all, look at what is a disciple, so that we'll know what we are talking about. What is a disciple, you know? What I just read was uh, Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. That says that therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. And the King James says that go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we are looking at what is a disciple. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Discipleship. Uh, what is it? So, uh, basically, discipleship, uh, it didn't begin from the Bible, actually. It's, it's not only a Bible word. It's something which is in the world. And uh, in Ghana, we call discipleship apprentice. A disciple is called an apprentice. If you know what an apprentice is, uh, uh, sometimes a guy is walking around as the country or the city and no work, and then the uncle gets him and says, I want to go and learn how to do carpentry or go and be a mechanic. And then uh, they find some money and then they go give the money to what they call in Ghana a master. Master being maybe the, uh, an accomplished, uh, we call fitter or mechanic, or maybe a headdress or a tailor. You take the boy or the girl to that person who is a boss or the teacher or the trainer, and then the person you're taking it becomes an apprentice. What apprentice does is that he goes to learn how to do the trade and how to manage the trade. So that he goes to learn what you call fitting or mechanics, uh, auto, auto repair in Ghana. The person goes, I know when I was in Ghana, I said, it's a guy who's fix my car for me. The man cannot speak English. He doesn't know, he can't even write a receipt when you give him the money. You want to pay for him. He can't be in right there. She said, Master Kwame, come and buy from me, receive from me. He doesn't know book, he doesn't know physics, he doesn't know uh, rotation, he doesn't know nothing. All he knows is that one day he, they took him to a so called master who's a pair, a pair, a pair repairer. And then he will watch the man do it. And the man will tell that this is a carburetor, this is brake, this is what the brake does. So he doesn't know no physics or no chemistry or no. Uh, Calculation. All he knows is that he watches the man handle brakes, handle carburetor, handle clutch, handle the gear, handle the engine. He watches him over the years and his thoughts. And they show him how to price uh, the goods, how to buy goods, how to speak so that they can, they can reduce the goods for you, how to handle customers. He doesn't, he doesn't write one note. He only watches, learns, hears, and practices. And after a while, the guy goes up his own shop, another part of town. They call him now Master, maybe Master John. He was telling me the Master Kwame, but now he's telling me he's now Master John by himself. And he gets other boys around him to train them. What had just happened was, it's called an apprenticeship. So that this John guy had been discipled through teaching to practice through watching and he, he does he fixes cars just like master kwame because master kwame took him through sometimes they will punish them sometimes they'll say go home go home sometimes they'll discipline them sometimes they, they beat them up sometimes they slap them say what's how you do a car sometimes they mess up some of this car the guy comes back and you know deal with them harshly 
it's a training process. It's called discipling. Mm. It was a learning, watching, practicing, apprenticing, and after a while, he can do the same thing. Same thing. So that's what disciple is, you know. Uh, it's better learning and uh, learning the concepts and practicing things. All right? All right, so uh, I've just shown you the example. In the Bible, we see uh, some examples. We see a man by name Elijah. Elijah, Elijah, sorry. Elijah trained a guy called Elisha. Elisha was on the prophet. Elisha was a, a farm manager. He was a business owner. But he got a call and followed this guy. When he followed him, he was pouring water on his hands. He was learning the ways of the prophetic. He was learning how the prophet behaves. Not the guy who kills his wife recently, right? I mean, he, was, he was learning how to hear from God, and how to, you know, all those things. And after a while, when the guy was going, he was given a particular mantle. And was able to prophesy what miracles two times his master's own. What happened? He was pouring water, he was following the man, he was washing his clothes, he was serving him, he was learning, he was taking counsel. And over time, he also became a prophet who was once a business owner, who was once a businessman, a business tycoon. Now he's skillful in the prophetic, he's skillful in ministry. He knows how to counsel, how to minister to kings, how to, you know handle national issues and he developed boldness you see, the guy who handle different things you know so uh it's apprenticeship is learning is discipleship all right now on the other hand there's another guy called gehazi gehazi was also a disciple of elisha but he wasn't a true disciple you know so when one day they heal a man and a man brings lots of money the mentor or the coach, which is Elijah, said, no, the thing the guy has brought, don't take what? I mean, per his training, he wasn't greedy about money or filthy looker. He feels that God first. He has to honor God. He has to go by God's convictions, God's principles. So he said, okay, they brought all these goods, money, goods. So I said, God, no. So I take them back. This guy has it, but was a bad, a, a bad apprentice. He thought he was wiser. Instead of learning the ways of the master, that, that part wasn't prophetical. It was just discipline. You see, maybe he was there thinking about, I just, I just want to learn how to profess and go away and get my money. But he had to learn other things too. And he was being trained. But he said, no, 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 no. He followed the man quietly, went to cut the things, and he ended up losing the things and becoming leprous. So we have to be true disciples of Christ, of God. That uh, simply means, in our, in, our, in our case, it simply means a true follower of Christ. A disciple of Christ, in our case, is a true follower. Follower. Let me put this way. A dedicated follower of Christ. Or let me put it another way. A committed follower of Christ. Or lover of Christ. You know? In our case, in the New Testament, nobody will force you to serve God. mm, -mm. In Christianity, it's not force. It is choice. It is willingness. It is yieldedness. So Christ makes an announcement. Whoever wants to come to me, want to be born again. He said, yes, sir, I want to come born again. You come, come, come born again. After they come born again, he will not chain you to obey him. He will not lash you to love him. He won't. He presents his rules, his love, and whatever his unction. And you have to decide to be a true follower. Discipleship is not by force, it's by, it's by choice. Mm -hmm. Paul calls himself a born servant. Born servant is a servant who is free by choosing to serve the master. See, in those days, the slaves, sometimes they serve me, serving you, and they say, Go home. They say, Okay, master, I'm not, you are so kind to me, I won't go home. I want to serve you by, by my will. That's a born servant. He chooses to serve the master. He can go home. You are released, you are free of the hope, go back. He said, no, master, I want to willingly love you and serve you. Discipleship is like a born servant. You choose to love Jesus. You choose to follow him with your heart, will, and soul. It's not by force. Glory to God. And so uh, that is what we are now. 
and I'm going to show you. Um, okay, let's write down John chapter 8, verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. Remember that discipleship is not by force, it's by choice. You love the Lord, you know what He has done for you, and you decide to give your all to Him so that He, he becomes your boss and your Lord and He rules. All right. So He says that, He says to the people, if you continue in my work, then are you my disciples indeed? Continue is choice, it's not force. If you decide to continually and continuously live in the word of God, receive the word and eat the word and practice the word and walk in the word, then you become a true disciple. There are true disciples and bad disciples, good and bad ones. My prayer is that you become a good disciple, a true disciple of Christ. Amen. That brings honor to God. That Amen. reflects the glory of God. That reflects the beauty of Jesus Christ. It's a choice. It's not, never going to be by force. When I, when I was a young believer, I used to use force for people to, to do, live right so that I would chase them. When I was a young pastor, I would follow my people. I, I said they are doing foolish things. I would, I would follow them and they, they run away and things. But I realized that it's foolish because you can't change nobody. They will have to have a conviction and a determination to love God and to serve God privately or publicly, secretly or openly. It's a choice you make. You know, I mean, now nobody has to follow me not to do what is wrong or right. I don't need anybody to follow me. I know God and I fear God, so I choose it. Look at a person like Joseph when he was alone with the Potiphar's wife. Uh, he had to make a choice. He chose that, no, I'm going to live for God. I fear God. I honor God. I want to stay for God. I want to live for God. I want to fulfill my purpose in God. So, Mrs. Potiphar, thank you very much. No way. It's a choice. And we are living in days where we need true disciples of Christ. True disciples, committed, yielded, determined, lovers of Christ, with passion, with the fear of God, doing the will of the Master. If you continue in my word, then I am my disciples indeed. There are many disciples today, and back in those days too, but were they disciples indeed? Or disciples in me. All right, let's look at another example in the life of uh, Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul and uh, Apostle Timothy. Pastor Timothy. Let's look. Let's look at something from them. Before we go there, there's a guy. It's a, a movie called uh, No Retreat, No Surrender. Do you, you know that movie? It's a movie. It's called No Retreat, No Surrender. I don't. I don't want anybody to watch movies, but I have about four movies I, I watch in this world. I know. <laughs> in this one, there was a a young guy who went to fight, like a Chinese uh, karate movie, or whatever. And he was beaten. The person that beat him, I mean, that thing really got into him. So he went to look for a, a in, going to the bush look for a Chinese coach, who is an old man, but he's experienced in the game. So the boy left his I mean, hometown or his apartment in the city and went to the village. I went to stay with the guy and for months, the guy was coaching him, training him, was watching the way he eats, the way he handled drink, the way he handled alcohol, he handled women, he handles time. And I mean, he was developing focus, purposefulness, determination, intensity. And he even showed him how to hit his leg against a tree about several times. The guy said, I'm tired. He said, no, I keep on hitting. And that training, the guy began to fight like the old old coach. And when he went back to the ring, people thought the coach was back in the ring. It was his training, who was cool and taught their philosophy, the, the, the focus, the mental strength, determination, purposefulness, alertness, agility, everything. Training over the years, he watched him, listened to him, changed his conversation, his talking, his philosophy, and the boy came was fighting like the old guy. And he beat the guy mercilessly because he has been trained. He gave himself up for the training. Because I live in that city, I said, No, I want to do this. I went to the, went to the bush and was trained. God is calling some of us, some of you, as you hear me tonight, mm -hmm. into close training program. 
to prepare you for the world. It's a key called brokenness. Brokenness is a key for usage. There are many of us who are born again, but we are not broken yet. We are strong in will. We're strong in our ways. Nobody can change your ways. Nobody can correct you. Not in God. If you say A is A, if you say no is no, you are so stuck. You are, you are, I mean, it's good. If you are strong in, in will, sometimes you are stubborn. And though you are following the master, every now and then you go your own way. But God is calling us to a place where our will will be yielded to him so that he leads us by choice as a place you have to be. The, day we, the days we are living in, uh, this type of preaching are not very popular, you know, because what you are, we are looking for is a breakthrough, power and strength and glory, hallelujah, glory. It's all good. We like that breakthrough. But there's a place. We have to come to the place of brokenness, a place of surrender, a place of yieldedness, a place of dedication, a place of, uh, the place where no longer my will, but his will. It's, it's a bit hard, but that's the, that's the best place to be, to manifest fullness of the beauty of Christ. There are going to be two disciples that will reflect his glory, his honor, his excellence and everything. You must come to that place where not my will, but I will, oh God. Not my desire, but I desire, oh God. You know, where, I mean, where, where, where I mean, your money is for God. The time is for God. God is in charge. And it's, it's, it's starting your life and bring it to a place of, of preparation for greater ministry and service. All right, so let's look at uh, Paul and Timothy. Uh, Paul was a big man of God. Timothy was his son. And I'm going to show you, Paul told, uh, made this statement. He says, be thou imitators of me as I am of Christ. The, the question is, what do, what do they imitate? Let's look at, uh, I want you to look at um, first, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Second Timothy 3, verse 10. What do you imitate? I'm going to show you how you have to imitate all around. Your leader, your pastor, your coaches, and ultimately Christ and God and his word. All the areas must be covered. Sometimes you don't, certain areas are not, it's a no-go area for God. Uh, okay, so let's, let me read that verse to you. I made it from 2 Timothy 3 verse. It says that, um, okay, you can go at it from verse 1, but that'd be too long. But I'll just say part of it. It says, this know that the last days, perilous times will come. Look at what it says, verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unfaithful. These are this could be all Christians, you see. It's gonna be prevalent in the last days. This is gonna be the character trait of people, whether in church or outside of, outside of church, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, and all that. Many, many things he says, but as he comes on, it keeps coming on, it comes all the way to verse verse 10. They say, but, somebody say, but, but, but you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, and patience. You see, yeah, you see, this other, uh, and, uh, I mean, the earlier verse we read, are going to be the characteristics of many Christians and many people in the world. They may be called Christians nominally, but the, what we said, the foregoing verses, are going to be their description. Say, so, but you, 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 Timothy, you are different. I've taught you my doctrine, my way of life, my purpose for living, my faith, my struggle, my long suffering, my love, and my patience. Persecution, oh man, that's another hard one. My affliction. You know, so he says that you have trained you. I've taken you to a particular school. So don't be like them. And tonight, let me speak to somebody. Don't be like the other kind of believers. 
Don't be like other worldly believers who have who are very carnal, who don't fear God, who don't respect God, who don't honor God, who take God for granted, who take church for granted. No, it's oh, a yeah. you have been trained. You have been given a certain type of schooling. Your pastor has taught you from the scriptures, from the word of God. Very, very important. Very, very important. Don't be like the rest. I pray that all of us will be like Timothy, who has been schooled in the patience, you know, the man of life and doctrine and long suffering, patience, charity, love. These are proper qualities of a, of a, of a disciple of God. It's not the car you drive, thank God for the cars. It's not the house you live in, thank God for the house. It's not where you travel to, thank God for the travels. It's not the, your paycheck, thank God for your paycheck. It's not your beauty, thank God for your, your beauty. It's not the money out of the bank, thank God for all those things. But it is these things that make you unique, that make you stand out. Listen, it says these are truths of the last days. It says there shall be perilous times. This is what happened in the, the world, but it must be different. I pray that all of us, me and you, we will start in a place, in a secret place, where God will have his way with us, where Christ will be Lord in our lives, where his word will rule over our lives. It will not be what we want, it will not be what our flesh wants, but what God wants. That's what we live for. But he said, if you continue in my work, then are you my disciples indeed. Two disciples are needed in this time. Two servants of God are, are wanted during this time. Today, if you go to my country, Ghana, all things are happening about men of God and prophets and things, and some of them don't know God. If they ever knew God, they never got repented or never got saved. If they ever got saved, they never got broken. They never got changed, transformed. They never gave themselves up to God. So they are themselves they found some gifting and they are flowing and there's no beauty in them. They repel the world. The world gets, become repulsive to the world. But we must be broken. Broken vessels. Broken. Our pride, our ego, our arrogance. Broken. And we are submitted to God and God has his own way. Very important. So give yourself all these areas. Your, your lack manner of living, your faith lack, your long suffering, make sure that you are growing all these areas. Not just you can speak in tongues, no, that's one part of it. But before beyond speaking in tongues, grow. Grow in the fruits of the spirits, you know, in character, in conduct. Let the word of God rule, prevail in you as a true disciple of God. You continue in the work. Somebody say amen. There are people today who don't care about, I mean, they don't, they don't care about anything. I mean, they don't care about anything. Once it's, it's, it's convenient for them, they'll do it. If it's convenient to tell lies, they'll tell lies. If it's convenient to go and have fornication, you can have fornication. No, it's that's not the that's not the disciple. The disciple goes at the at the at the at the at the, at the behest of his master. What the master wants is what you seek to do. You may not be perfect, but that's your desire. That's that's what you are pushing towards. All right, so let's move on. I want, I want to center my discussion on uh, John chapter 6, and we'll, we'll end for the night. In John chapter 6 shows me a lot of stuff there. I'm talking about the mindset of, the, of, the, of a true disciple, the mindset or the attitude of a true disciple. Now, in John chapter 6, it's a very long chapter, about 70 verses. Now, what happens was that we see two kinds of disciples. True disciples, let me say flaky disciples, they were all following Jesus. Now, the agendas were different. Their motivations were different. But they were all around the body of Jesus Christ. They were all in his company. They were all in his camp. They were all in his atmosphere. But they were two different people. When, when, when things got off, we saw the difference. <laughs> when things got bad, we knew who is who. Are you hearing that? Okay, so let's see if we can run through it briefly. First of all, there was a there was a healing. Christ gave a healing, and many people came to came around him. And the question is, why are you in church? 
Mm. Why are you in church? People have different reasons to be in church. Some are in church to find a nice wife. Some are looking for a husband in church. It's a good idea. It's a good, very good idea. But for people, that's all. Why they even come to our churches? That's all. Some are looking for fellowship, a cool, so that when they have a, they have a funeral, someone will be there for them. So for them, that's all. That's all it's about. But it goes beyond that. Some are looking for healing, which is good. Some are looking for breakthrough, which is good. But there has to be a higher purpose than just getting physical material needs. A true disciple, well, it can be drawn in by some felt needs, but they, they stay for higher purpose. Mm. That's why uh, Paul says that if because of this world we are serving God, we are most miserable. If we are serving God only for the things of this world, then we are miserable. Hello? We have to have a higher purpose. So these people came to Christ, they were dead in their numbers, maybe thousands, because he performed the healing. Uh, he know the sick. Now along the line, there was some hunger because the people were many at night time was going. So you multiplied bread, <laughs> and the people ate and they were full. And that evening, Christ went over the river, Tiberias River and went to another place. The people woke up and was not there. Obviously, they were seeking Jesus. See, see they were seeking him. What for? <laughs> Bible says that Jesus said, uh, "You seek me because of the bread." So all that jumping around and jumping about was not for him, but for his bread. Those guys were not true disciples. They were following all right, but they were not following based on who he is and living for him, but they were following because they can get bread to eat. It is so sad that today in our churches, people are just following Christ because of physical and material things alone. When things get tough, they are gone. If you do them, they are gone. One hard preaching, they are gone. One offense, they are gone. One disturbance, they are gone. That is not a true disciple. A true disciple has got resilience. Mm. You cannot easily push them by your little offense. No. He is looking for a higher purpose, higher goal. He wants to please the master. He wants to follow Christ all through. So one little disappointment, one little offense, will not kill them. See, there are people who have served God in this world and they don't get all the breakthroughs we have, but they still serve God to the end. There are people who went to India, China, as missionaries for years and years, never drove a good car or lived in a good house, but they still love and serve God. We call them, we are sold out for the gospel. We did that today. You're hearing me today, I want to encourage you. Don't be petty. Don't let small, small things disturb you. Because the way the person looked at me, I won't come to church again. Hey! That's mm -hmm. because they were, they were distributing food. They gave me uh, only fish. They didn't give me the cow feet. So you're angry. Oh! This is so petty! <laughs> they gave me uh, what you would ask to pastor. He said, this is petty! <laughs> some people die for the gospel some people pay that with, with their blood some were lost some were went through stuff let's have a higher purpose Amen. these guys were following him because of the bread now look, the funny thing I saw is this it says that they were trying to take him and make him a king by force mm. so see that people talk about Christ is my Lord. But that Lord sometimes means something different from what we all think it is. Lord of breakthrough, Lord of that will help me in this life. But when we take Christ as our Lord, we're not talking about just because of food. He is the boss of your life. He is the one who, con who calls the shots. He controls your choices, your movement, your activities, not what your body feels. A disciple is dead. Not is my will, but your will be done. So these people are going to take him, make him a king because of the food. I pray. I hope you're not serving God just because of the food or what you're going to get. Now I want to rule. Leave all down. There's so many things there. But I want to rule. So 
I come to the last part of it, the last part, and I'll end with that. The last part is very important to me. As they kept on going, you know, back and forth and forth, they came to a point. When Christ began to teach and he taught truth as he knows it to be, it's a very difficult thing to understand, but let, let's just leave that, that, that difficult part aside. But the point is that he was saying something they did not like. He was saying something that was not pleasant to their ears. And they began to grumble. They began to grudge. And say, whoa, what a saying. Who can accept it? And they began to leave him. Let's look at uh, look, let's look at uh, let's look at verse uh, verse 59 uh, and uh, downwards. He said this while teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can bear? Who can accept it? <laughs> Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said, Does this offend you too? Now let's let's begin to look at it slowly. On hearing this, many left. So the teaching of Christ offended them. And said, No, we can't we, can, we can't follow you. Well, you hear the sick, you multiply bread, we eat, we're fine. But you're, this is your teaching. We don't like your teaching. <laughs> and therefore, we leave you. We didn't come here for discomfort. The Bible says that in the last days, there will be people who are doing what they call 18 years preaching. What do you want to hear? That one is easy. We can tell you nice things. That will make you feel good. But the truth is what must be preached, whether we like it or not. And the three of you go to many churches, plenty of people are plenty of people are there, plenty. I mean, some places, plenty. I'm not saying all of them are wrong. But for most of them, they don't know anything about the Lordship of Christ, about the discipleship, about the fear of God, about repentance, about going to heaven, about brokenness. All they care is, Pastor, bless me, pray for me. That's all. Don't touch my heart. Don't touch my character. Don't touch my will. I mean, I will do whatever I want to do. As for God, I will save him. As for God, I will bring him his little money on Sunday. But don't touch anything about me, about my... No, 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 Pastor. I want to be me, but just come and get some blessing. I want to remain intact. Just, I will come to your church. I will come and sit down. You pray for me and my children, protect me, and I will do... My business, whether it's bad or not bad, but, but that one is not your business. Just let me do anything I want to do. Just have my boyfriend, girlfriend. Just have a second wife. And just every, just, we'll just ask your church. Because I love your church. You come to church. That is not the type of worship. I mean, God, you may be born again, saved. What thing we got? Saved by grace. That's okay. But you'll not be going to true discipleship. You can't make men much impact. You can affect the world. You can make, you can be a game changer. You can touch lives because you are not united to God. We don't want anything to touch us. My pride, leave me alone. My anger, leave me alone. My wickedness, leave me alone. Just make me happy. Just anoint me with oil. Give me a nice communion, and, and everything's okay. Pastor, we are, yeah, Pastor, that's the deal, right? It's a deal. Don't touch me. I don't touch you. We're fine. I just ask for offering. I miss more. That's not a thing. That's not a thing. That's not a thing. That's not a thing. God wants to break through our us and be Lord indeed of our hearts. And sometimes, trust me, some of the things God asks us to do is hard on the flesh. It's hard on the flesh. Sometimes it's very hard on the flesh. It's like, man, 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 this thing is serious. If it's for Christ, I would have done something different. But if you are broken this up, it's okay, let your will be done. Even if you are struck, say, Lord, help me do what you want me to do. That's the place I want us. I'm not preaching law, but I'm just trying to encourage us to come to that place where he has his way with us, where he is Lord, where he rules. Where he, 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 I mean, he's in charge of our lives. That's a life we call discipleship. We're learning, we're just learning, learning his, his thoughts, we're learning his ways. 
We are doing his great things. We are permitting him to have his own. Now the disciple, those disciples, you see that, that, that movie I'm talking about, the guy was say, come on, hit the game. Knock your leg against the thing again. It's not what he wants, it's what he wants. And may God help all of us. Sometimes we, you're a wife and uh, your husband is giving you too much problem and you have to respond. Some things come into your head. But the Bible says that submit your husband. Oh my word, it's difficult. But as a disciple, you do that. Uh, the Bible says that forgive, people offend you. It's so hard. But according to the Bible, you can forgive. You can forgive. As a disciple, it's called for spiritual formation. God is forming himself inside you. You show the beauty of Christ. So well, he said it's hard. Now the disciple is a person. Let me let me let me let me, let me learn by showing this. When they said I thought Christ would say, Oh, I beg you, don't go. I said, I told you, I said, Oh, Peter, I beg you, 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 you should, don't go. He said, Do you also want to go away? That means that discipleship is by choice. Mm. Nobody will ever force you to serve God. Nobody will ever say force to be holy. No. Holiness, integrity, truthfulness is a choice. It may come at a cost, but it's a choice you have to make. You decide. So I like what Peter said. I like what Peter said. Peter, Peter says something. Peter said something I love so much. Uh, that is in verse uh, 66. Okay. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. The sister says that you don't want to leave too, do you? He has the 12. <laughs> and look at what Peter said. That's, what, that's our, our focus for the night. I love it. Peter said, Lord, First of all, to become a disciple, you have to see him as a Lord. To be able to submit yourself to the rule of the Lord, to his authority, you have to see him indeed as your Lord, as your boss, as your king. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the Jehovah in the flesh, the creator in the flesh. And let's see him as our Lord. And not that Lord of, of, of bread and fish, but Lord of our lives. Amen? Amen. Then he says, To whom shall we go? Where else? Huh. I mean, there's no, there's no option. Are you hearing me? Yeah. If I leave Christ, where else do I go? What are, what are my options? There's no other options. So Peter, as a true disciple, was fully convinced that this is the Messiah, is the prophet Moses spoke about. We have found him, and we are here. We are going nowhere. Hmm. I want to encourage the child of God. Convince yourself that outside Christ, there's no other option. Outside Christ, there's no other choice. And be fully convinced and stay in there. To whom shall we go? Who else we go to? We are convinced he's a law, is a, a savior, is a prophet, is a messiah, is a Jehovah in our midst. So we are determined to stay here. And that choice must be made. You know, when we're, when we're young believers, uh, there's a certain song we used to sing a lot. This is, this is, you know, you guys don't sing those songs. We used to sing them a lot. And it, it inspires us. So tell songs like this Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to do. It's like I've come, I've, I've been giving all to you. I don't want to go anywhere. But these days, if you guys don't sing those songs, it's, it's all songs for you now. So my, my, daughter, my daughter told me that it doesn't like hymns because they, they, they make her too depressed. But, but I sing the hymns, I sing the hymns, and they, they, they make me feel surrounded. It informs me, my whole being, that hey, I am for the Lord. See, consecrated Lord to do that. It's very important. It's very important. Very important to do that thing. Because that is the only place to have. You can't go anywhere. Listen, you, go, you don't go back to the well. You don't go back to your old boyfriend. You don't go back to your own way of living. There's nothing there again. Don't go back to the devil. Some of you were being, the devil was molesting you, pestering you, 
disturbing you and you came to Christ, there is nowhere else to go. If somebody offends you in the church, there is nowhere else to go. Amen. Forgive the person and stay in church. Ah, don't you understand? Yes, somebody offends you in church. It's people who offend you because we are not perfect. Not that we offend any other people that are preaching. Forgive us. Forgive your friends. If they offend you, if they lie about you, forgive them and stay in check. To whom shall we go? Where else are you going? Today, the, you know the guy, the guy who, 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 who had, he had a story of the guy who killed his wife recently. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know he had left Christ? Oh, that is crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on his Facebook. He left Christ about last year, and he's preaching against the Bible. He's preaching against the Bible. To whom shall we go? The devil will take you over. The devil will mess your mind and give you crazy ideas. He said, told the wife, I will kill you or your sister. Are you a demon? Can you, I mean, and he did it. If you find Christ, stay with Christ. Amen. Don't let anything be seen. There's nothing in the world. Though. There's no strength in the sex in the world. There's nothing strange. Well, they met a certain lady, young lady, who was, who was messing up. I said, why did you do that? Because she was a nice Christian lady. He said, first I was curious. Curious about what? There's nothing, nothing really, really curious. She was to find. Amen. If you have found Christ, and let's, let me say something to some of you here. Some of you are Christians. Fear God. You are born again. You have the Holy Ghost. But things are not working well for you. It does not mean that go somewhere else. Hmm. Look, sometimes you are born and even as a sometimes you take what you, what you are due, you, you are not getting. That's the meaning. That's it. no. You are lo a loving sister. You love God. You, you you honor God. You read the Bible. You give your tithes, and you are supposed to be blessed in some way. But the blessing hasn't come as yet. Paul said, "You know my patience and my long suffering. It's part of the whole game. Hold on to patience and long suffering, and keep on going." It's sometimes very difficult for those of you women who, are, who, 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 who have been serving God. I know one lady who was, I mean, she loved God for years. She served God and she didn't get married. It, I know it's painful, but there's something bigger than that. You know, we all wish that we get the cars and the homes and the monies and the fame and the joy and the breakthrough. But if we don't have them, there is something better for us in God. Am I making sense to you? Yes. I know something better for, I know, I mean, we wish, we pray for you that, oh, get all the breakthroughs, get all the things we need, the things on this world. Yes, we enjoy them. We pray that everyone will have them. A favor will locate you, you'll be blessed. But when they have not come, as a disciple, you don't check out. You stay in there and keep on moving and keep on stretching and keep on moving in Christ. And one of the things God will show you is oneness. Amen. Amen. The Peter said, To whom shall we go? Now look at the next, the next sentence. You have the words of eternal life. Listen, a true disciple has eternal life in their mind. <laughs> a true disciple of Christ has eternal life. Heaven is on their mind. Eternal salvation is on their mind. They're not just serving God for money alone, I need the money. And just have going for the cars, I don't win the cars, but they have had their higher, higher motive, higher motive of eternality that someday this world will end. Corona has shown you and me that death is imminent, nobody has control about death. And when the life is over, what happens next? So, on your mind, must be eternal matters, eternal issues. A person said, you have the words of eternal life when we have come to you. Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? I want to encourage you, child of God, the disciple of Christ, let your mind be fixed. Amen. Let your mind be fixed. Don't let anything deceive you. The Apostle Paul says that I count as done all things for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. I know that we are living, we are, we are charismatic. We believe in breakthrough. We believe in those things. But listen, those things are secondary to eternal matters. When this life is over, a car doesn't mean anything. 
Whilst you are alive, we need a good car to drive. Hallelujah. We need good things to enjoy. Right? I love, I love all those things. But listen, beyond all those things, it's eternal matters. And they must be put first. And if those things are what has going to, going to sustain you in your work with God, you will come to a point where you have to make a decision between your carnal flesh and the word of God. I pray that you choose the word of God because you are a follower of Christ. You imitate Christ. You follow in his steps. You do the will of the master. You seek to please the master. You want the approval of God. So you choose the way of God. You choose the way of honor, the way of truth, the way of righteousness. And as a disciple of Christ, you, you, you have to be able to speak the word to the world mm -hmm. as part of your commission. Tell the world that Jesus is alive. He still saves. I want to leave you tonight uh, as we close. We will continue next week. But remember that you are called by God and uh, it's a purpose on your life. And most times, purposes are work out when you are broken. If you are stubborn hands of God, it's difficult for God to work his stuff. I pray that you yield yourself and say, God, here I am. Take me and use me and let your name be glorified. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God strengthen you. I pray that we shall grow in discipleship. We shall grow in missions. We can affect our world. We shall be a blessing. In Jesus' name, somebody said, Amen.